Uh, you're on. You're on. Jika, and welcome from Nam on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. My name is Sharon Braun, and I'm an associate director of programming with CEDA. I'm pleased to introduce today's live stream discussing discussion on attracting and retaining First Nations employees to your business. Wherever you are today and wherever you work, live and play, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country we are meeting on. We recognise your continuing connection to the land and waters and acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on this land and commit to building a brighter future together. We all want access to jobs where we can bring our whole selves and where we are supported and valued. We look forward to hearing from our panel today on how to attract and retain Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforces through the provision of culturally safe, supportive and progressive environments. Today's live stream is the last in the 2022 Empowering First Nations People series, where we have explored higher education, health and authentic community engagement. We look forward to continuing discussions in 2023 on topics which engage and impact Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, including the pathway to the voice to Parliament. For more than 60 years, CEDA has identified policy issues that matter for the future of all Australians. Through independent research and frank debate, we pursue solutions that deliver better economic and social outcomes and disrupt for good. We look forward to you joining us as we continue on this mission in 2023. Of course, 2022 is not quite at its end and we have a number of events still on the program on topics such as the labour market, decarbonisation skills, South Australia's wine sector and in Sydney on December 6, we are honoured to host Dr Jackie Huggins, Shelley Rays, Bridget Kammer and Narelda Jacobs as we discuss the legacy of Paul Keating's 1992 Redfin Address, The Path to the Voice and Beyond. Visit cedar.com.au to explore the program and register. As always, the opportunity to actively participate in today's conversation is a mainstay of CEDA's forums. Follow CEDA across our social media channels and add your comments and key takeaways using the hashtag Indigenous. Put your questions to the panel via our Pigeonhole app, which is available just below the live stream window on your screen, or log in on your devices by entering the URL cedar.pigeonhole.au, sorry, .at, and enter using the password Indigenous. We will endeavour to ask as many of your questions as time allows, but to help us understand those questions with the broadest interest, please review and vote on the questions entered into the app. Please also take a moment at the end of the live stream to rate your experience of today's discussion in Pigeon Hall. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for today's discussion. Caitlin Le Leslie is a proud Noongar woman and the Indigenous Employment Manager at Mindaroo Foundation's Generation One. Over the past two years, she has been a key member of the 2022 Indigenous Employment Index research team and leads the Indigenous Employment Network comprising over 100 employers. In her current role, she supports organisations to build strategic Indigenous employment and cultural capability through building inclusive workplaces where Indigenous employees can thrive and have meaningful careers. Caitlin, thanks so much for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sharon, and Kaya, and good morning, everyone. I would also like to begin the session today by acknowledging the land I'm dialing in from today, the land of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respect to all of the country that you're calling in from today and to extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the call today. So look, thank you so much for choosing to start your week with this really special webinar on empowering First Nations people, attracting and retaining employees. As Sharon said, I'm Caitlin Leslie, a proud Noongar woman from the southwest of WA and the Indigenous Employment Manager at the Mindoo Foundation, but also your facilitator. I would also like to give a very warm welcome to our fabulous panellists today. We have Trish Oxford, the General Manager of Indigenous Business and Community Engagement from Australian Unity. We also have Amanda Fotheringham, the Indigenous Business Partner, Talent Acquisition and People from GHD. And we have Kelly Van Nielsen, the Managing Director of Operations from Serco. So I'm really looking forward to this yarn today on the topic of attraction and recruitment. But look, for me, 
I've been immersed in all things Indigenous employment for nearly three years with my work at Generation One and most recently highlighted in our Indigenous Employment Index. The Indigenous Employment Index was the first comprehensive snapshot of Indigenous workplace representation, practices and employee experiences ever to be carried out in Australia. Our research found that while organisations have been on the journey and have made good progress, there is still so much to be done to ensure culturally safe workplaces where Indigenous Australians can thrive and have meaningful careers. The immense opportunity awaits for you to reflect on your current approach to ensure a comprehensive and systematic approach, in particular embedding an Indigenous cultural lens to your existing attraction and recruitment approaches. But I want to know, do you have Indigenous voices informing your attraction and recruitment approach? Have you asked your in existing Indigenous employees what their experience was when it came to joining your organisation? Or why would your organisation even be attractive to an Indigenous employee? All of these questions and more are needed to reflect, to adapt your approaches to ensure equitable employment outcomes for my mob. But look, our research, our research involved 105 participants in interviews and focus groups, 71% of which were Indigenous employees. And many of those Indigenous interview participants raised that they see one of the most common challenges is that employers focus only on entry level recruitment for my mob when it comes to bringing on people into their organisation. This is one challenge amongst many when it comes to recruiting mob, and I'm excited to hear from the three specialists today to share their views and approaches to attracting and retaining Indigenous workers. But look, we highly encourage your participation today, so please use the Pigeonhole app and send your questions to our panellists and really optimise the knowledge and skills we have on the call today. But look, I'd love to hand over to our panellists to make their opening comments, starting with Trish today. Thanks, Trish. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Trish Oxford, and I'm a proud Nimba woman from far northwest New South Wales, and I'm Australian Unity's General Manager for Indigenous Business and Community Engagement. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we are all live streaming from. And for me, that's the beautiful Bundjalung country. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to brothers and sisters in the virtual room. So I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow guest speakers, host and facilitator Sharon, Caitlin, Amanda and Kelly, and thank you so much, CEDA, for inviting me to participate in today's event. Uh, it's a real privilege to be with you talking about such an important topic this morning, one that I'm personally passionate about, and that's making sure our mob have access to the same opportunities that uh, other non-Indigenous people have. Um, it's important that we have a culturally safe environment and importantly, we're nurtured in these environments. Australian Unity has a long history. We were established in 1840 and is Australia's first member-owned wellbeing company. We provide health, wealth and care services, including services that are designed and delivered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So in 2016, AU launched our first reconciliation plan and in early December we'll be proudly launching our stretch wrap with a vision to empower all of our people to become lifelong champions for reconciliation and to support our mob to thrive through Australian Unity's commitment to wellbeing. So the new RAP seeks to achieve this through delivering real and tangible outcomes built around three focus areas and one importantly being meaningful careers and opportunities. Our dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander business, Aboriginal Home Health, provides culturally tailored care and support to our mob in their communities. It was established in 2018 with the aim of addressing some of the significant gaps in holistic wellbeing outcomes. We've grown to be one of the largest home care providers for our community in New South Wales. And we're also really proud to be one of the largest employers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in New South Wales with over 250 employees in the business. And most importantly, 
they're mostly women. So last year, our incredible home health team delivered over 172,000 hours of care and support to more than 2,800 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their families and their communities. Such an awesome achievement. And this includes a range of allied health services, meals, prep, help in the home, transport, respite care and social outings like our Elders Olympics and our in-demand yarn ups. So I firmly believe that as a company, culture is central to how we attract and retain a vibrant, thriving and happy Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce. So at AU, our MOBS culture is celebrated and incorporated into our everyday business and advocacy initiatives. We, like many others, mark days of cultural significance and publicly support the Uluru Statement from the Heart and a voice to Parliament. So these reconciliation efforts do not go unnoticed. They're recognised and valued by our mob and our customers. So when our unique, rich history and culture is appreciated and celebrated, it builds a sense of inclusion across the company. And this is crucial when attracting and retaining an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce. One of the ways that we recognise consistently works to attract more to our roles is through our onboarding process, which has been designed to fit the cultural needs of our candidates. And in addition to that, our dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander talent specialists take a personalised approach to our onboarding process. A great example of this is our mob onboarding days, run in community for community. So these events are unique because they include our elders as VIP guests. It's so aspiring employees can get to know our customers and their needs over a cuppa and, of course, a good yarn. So we believe this interaction between new recruits and our elders is critical to developing at the very beginning a connection between workforce and our customers. It's also a major consideration for our people given the important place our elders occupy in our culture. We've got active recruitment and career progression strategies in place to retain and develop our employees. These include targeting career growth in specific geographical areas and specific business units. Increasing the number of internships and work placements and reducing employee attrition through initiatives based on onboarding and exit insights. So I guess to summarise, Australian Unity is deeply committed to creating meaningful careers. We strive to be a first choice employer for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we do this by committing to increasing employment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to 5% of employees an uplift from our current baseline of 3.6%. We grow our internal talent by developing opportunities across our business. In addition to our uplift of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employees, we aim to see 5% of this cohort at managerial and influential leadership positions. And then the third area is fostering a diverse organisation through nurturing and respectful, inclusive culture that provides equal opportunity to grow, learn and develop. So I'm really looking forward to today's session and look forward to the questions coming our way. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Trish. And I might hand over to Amanda, please. Yeah, ma all. My name is Amanda Fotheringham. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm joining from today, the Durrabal people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I forward that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on this call today. Uh, so I'm a very proud Gamilaroi in Murawarina and a descendant of the Western Captain families. And I'm currently the Indigenous business partner for talent acquisition and people here at GHG. And I've been in this role since April this year. I feel very excited and fortunate to be working at a company who has a sincere dedication to First Nations people and reconciliation. So GHG has been on this journey for over a decade now, and uh, we're very fortunate to have had passionate leaders, both First Nations and non-First Nations, uh, from the outset working in this space. 
we originally started with an Indigenous engagement strategy uh, before we hopped into the RAP program. We started out with a, rec uh, a Reflect Reconciliation Action Plan. Uh, we grew to our current Innovate RAP and next year we'll be looking to move to a Stretch RAP. Uh, it, it's always been very important to GHG that we ensure we, we've laid the right foundations for success. Um, and some of our key achievements have been creating ways for First Nations people to identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our HR systems, establishing our internal Indigenous network to create the opportunity for mob to connect and come together over a cup of tea. Uh, establishing and maintaining our Indigenous services team to lead the implementation of strategies around employment, procurement and cultural awareness. We've also implemented our cultural leave where First Nations employees can access, access an extra two days paid leave throughout the year uh, for NAIDOC week, sorry business, men's business, women's business, for whatever cultural reason that they might need that extra leave. Uh, and we've also implemented our cultural awareness online training modules. Uh, and very excitingly, a couple of weeks ago, we hit our 2000 employee target completing that since uh, the launch of our current wrap. It's a very exciting time for GHD and I'm really looking forward to what we have ahead of us. Thank you so much, Amanda. And Kelly, finally, can I hand over to you? Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Van Nelson, the Managing Director of Operations at Circle. I'm dialing in today from a very remote area of the UK, so hopefully connectivity holds up. However, on behalf of Circle, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which the Australian Circle offices are located and those on which we live, visit and provide our services. Um, I'll start by saying I've worked in enterprise workforce solutions for close on three decades across three continents, um, but the work I do at Circle is the most rewarding of my career. And that's a result of the critical business to government public services that Circle delivers across the country, uh, where we employ almost 15,000 people on a day-to-day -day basis and interact with thousands more of our citizens through the services that we provide every day. These services relate to healthcare, for, um, for example, for Australian Defence Force and the provision of elements of state government healthcare in some of the country's most remote regions, including WA Country Health and the Northern Territory. Um, an example would be uh, the provision of clinical um, uh, vaccines for over 95% of the NT population during COVID and the diversity of the workforce uh, was absolutely essential in doing a good job there. We also deliver a range of education, housing, transport, taxation, justice, defence and human services touching upon many important aspects of everyday life for all um, people across Australia and we're trusted by government to deliver services into diverse communities across the nation, including to many First Nations people. Providing essential public services and delivering these complex contracts um, in some of the most complex and challenging environments um, often involves caring for some of the most vulnerable people in the country. And this makes our reconciliation journey an important platform for our future success and the recruitment and retention of a talented and diverse workforce, an ongoing priority for Circle. After our second reconciliation action plan, we have celebrated and learned from a number of the successes and the learnings, but we've implemented several new impactful recruitment strategies, made significant purchasing adjustments to improve indigenous business supply chain and spend, and also rolled out a plethora of really uh, customised community support programmes that are being further nurtured under our third reconciliation action plan, several of which are conducted in collaboration with government. Uh, we continue to trial new initiatives. We don't always get it right, but we evolve and we learn. And through this act of listening and learning and developing a deeper understanding across all areas of the organisation, we can aim to do better and improve every day. And this starts with bringing greater awareness about the cultures and spirits of First Nations people, both internally and with our external stakeholders. Um, as a nation, our knowledge and understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and culture is poor, and most of us have a deficit-based view. And the social context and environment for change and progress 
isn't always positive and fundamental barriers to First Nations people fully participating in the economic, social and employment opportunities afforded to the wider community, unfortunately still too often remain. Um, from a circle perspective, from an attraction and retention um, uh, lens, we have made some great progress. Um, my own commitment is to keep learning and striving to contribute to a better future by providing employment parity and doing more to create education opportunities, creating fit for purpose bridges into employment, into meaningful employment, and to making the workplace more inclusive and culturally safe for First Nations people through language, representation, policy, and by breaking down barriers, ensuring that every individual in our organization matters, feels heard, is treated with mutual respect. And my hope is that we create an environment where every person we employ at Circle can thrive to reach their fullest potential and be valued for the unique skills they bring to the organization. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, sharing some of the things that have worked well for us and equally delving into some of the things we did not get quite right and how we might approach things differently moving forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. And look, I'm so excited for today's yarn. I think um, all three of our panellists today have touched on just the, the deep value that Indigenous employees bring to an organisation, you know, 60,000 years plus of knowledge and history and, you know, how we can influence large organisations around Australia to adapt with Indigenous ways of knowing being and doing and I think we have the perfect people to talk about this on the call today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to all panellists with um, my opening questions um, so please answer as you see fit but I would love to know um, in, in developing your Indigenous employment attraction and recruitment strategy what were the key considerations for your organisation? Um, perhaps Trish you might want to jump in. Sure thanks Caitlin it's a really good question. You know, when I was reflecting on this question, I had to think deeply to really pick out the key areas that we at Australian Unity wanted to prioritise. And I guess the, the main one is to ensure that uh, the organisation was firmly committed to building out an Indigenous-specific employee um, valuation proposition. So it's really important that the organisation understands that we need to utilise different strategies to attract and retain our mob. So firm commitment from the organisation was a key priority. And the other area that we needed to consider deeply was to ensure that we had our engagement processes and strategies in place so we were able to hear from our people in terms of what was important to them on their journey into employment at Australian Unity. So really getting out and about, having those yarns that I touched on before to understand how we were going to make that journey into our workforce for our people um, palatable and culturally appropriate. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I love that you touched on really starting with your reason why, that commitment from your company before, you know, progressing with action to ensure the authenticity. Thank you. Amanda or Kelly? Um, so for GHD, we're currently in the process of updating um, our First Nations employment strategy. And one of the key things for us is centering and elevating the voices and experiences of our First Nations employees. And I've done this before at other organisations. And the way that we did that was through a First Nations employee experience survey and that asked questions around, um, you know, your team and your managers. You know, how did you feel? You know, did you feel culturally safe around them? How is your well-being supported within the workplace um, as well? And what were some of your general feedback and ideas that we could pull together in this strategy to improve your experience? Um, we ended up having some fantastic data come from that survey. And we ended up taking that to yarning circles again with 
some of our First Nations employees and really created that safe space, that confidential space where they could talk to their experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly, the positive, the great, all of, all of that. Um, it's very important that they know that what they have to share about their experiences is, is not going to go uh, any further, but will be uh, turned into, you know, tangible outcomes, a way forward, you know, there's going to be actions and steps taken by the business just formalised in a document. Um, you know, we did that and I and I think for businesses, I think obviously you need to get them in a place where they're ready to go on this journey. But as you elevate the experiences of your First Nations employees, you're really centering that experience. And if you're not doing that, I don't think you're setting yourself or your business up for success. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And Kelly? Um, yeah, I mean, Circle operate from uh, over 100 sites and they're, they're incredibly diverse and uh, vast in terms of geographical spread. Uh, so for us, it has been vital to invest in local relationships with First Nations organisations, businesses and communities um, to provide a sort of depth and richness to complement some of our national strategies, which include you know, targeted position investments and, the t and uh, programs and uh, the use of data to understand our workforce mix and improve on that. Um, I, I guess we're lucky we've got incredible sponsorship from our CEO and the wider executive to continue to invest and that's incredibly important and needed. Um, and we've approached things with a blended, um, a blend of targeted recruitment strategies, national initiatives, and local programs, and they all dovetail together to complement one another. Uh, and culture is multifaceted, so there isn't one size fits all, I guess. Uh, so we continue to improve on cultural competence and um, expand these programs. Um, from a targeted perspective, uh, uh, we've, we've had examples where we've actually um, applied, for example, for leveraging section 26 of um, the Public Services Commissioner's directions to um, take an affirmative measure perspective to re redress under representation in areas of the business. And that's had really great success for us. Um, but nationally, we've also got a dedicated central team of recruiters, but they're supplemented by local people on the ground who do conduct yarn circles and do um, approach um, attraction and um, career assessment in a very different way. Um, and that's really about removing barriers for entry or breaking down barriers for entry. Um, all of the recruitment team have been trained in unconscious bias training, but also more importantly, um, some cultural training around understanding and remembering the differences in communication styles. Um, for example, silences might be longer or making eye contact is not always deemed polite. And there are many different nuances that the recruitment team need to be very mindful um, of to make sure candidates and applicants feel welcome and um, that their strengths are going to be well understood and that we will work incredibly hard to find the right position to fit their um, ongoing career goals. Um, we uh, have developed various, uh, actually we've also trained over 1,400 of our employees, all people managers, have to go through cultural training. So that's not just a recruitment team initiative, it's an all of business initiative. Um, we've also invested in various uh, roles, including an indigenous programs manager and an indigenous liaison officer and a number of First Nations recruiters. And uh, we get in th these uh, positions really help us to have those more informal interactive chats, the yarn circles, we actually have weekly yarn circles um, which can not just be about the recruitment process, it can be around a whole scope of different topics, everything from housing and affordable housing to suitable workwear, to understanding uh, workplace norms, which in our different environments can vary quite uh, enormously. Um, and uh, we also conduct mentoring and workshops. Um, uh, we've got many of our First Nations people assigned to mentors, um, it is optional, but um, we have a huge number that leverage that option. And that is on an ongoing basis to make sure that um, all things happening in family and community are understood and we can do our very best by our people. Um, I might pause there for a second.
Thank you, Kelly. I'm so excited to hear more about Circa. I think um, for all the organisations online today, having that curated and bespoke approach to the communities that you're working in, but then levelling that with the cultural competency of your organisation is so critical. Um, We've got a really interesting question here on the Q&A, so I might throw to that really quickly because I think um, you'll definitely have some interesting points to share. One um, person has asked, what are your strategies to elevate First Nations employees into more senior positions? It seems that once we move beyond the entry level, promotion doesn't take into consideration cultural issues. So I think even our research through the Indigenous Employment Index found that Indigenous leadership was severely lacking um, across most organisations. So I'm curious on the call, um, any comments about that question to the panellists? Sure, Caitlin, I'll respond to that one just quickly. You know, I think it's vitally important Again, commitment from the organisation to identify key leadership roles, um, really important annually to have a look across the scope of the business, identify and target these roles. Now, you know, people are busy, things get overlooked, but if your intent is to actually elevate more of our mob into senior leadership positions, we then have to action that, and that is by identification and earmarking roles. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Kelly or Amanda? Uh, I, I might jump in um, to supplement the um, high touch, very personal approach around mentoring and uh, what Trish mentioned there and the importance of understanding um, individual aspirations. Um, we've also at Circle invested heavily in technology to support some of this um, uh, uh, career progression. So we have um, taken a two-pronged approach. The first is around attraction. So we implemented what we call our First Nations Employment Hub. And that was um, established as effectively a hub in 2021 to accelerate employment participation at Circle for First Nations people and then support them through their career journey. Um, and it is online. There are lots of online resources, but it is supplemented by that one-to-one -one mentorship. Um, since we put that in, we actually had a 70% increase in applicants, a 20% increase in hire, and we have really good representation moving up in the career ranks through Circle and moving across the organisation into other career areas. Um, for me, I think it's just really deeply understanding the individual and everything that makes up um, a person. Everybody's unique. Everybody's different. Um, understanding the flexibility um, can be important. So, um, you know, flexibility can be uh, different for different people and it can, um, you know, it can be around um, tailoring the benefits and being highly tailored and considered about that to accommodate different needs and helping people through that um, career path. Um, but yeah, the, the big one would be back to cultural integrity. We do uh, try and make sure we create a culturally inclusive and safe space where all employees are, and our First Nations peoples feel secure in their own identity um, and that can't be achieved through policy alone. It should permeate through the whole organisation where the employer walks the, uh, you know, walks the walk, every employee models the values and that our values are embedded and uh, widely understood, but that we also allow for individualism um, and people to bring their own set of unique values and uh, aspirations to the table. Um, so, yeah, it's back to, you know, lots of national approaches, but also um, individualistic. Yeah, thank you. Amanda, any comments? Yeah, so this is definitely something GHD is working on. Um, at the moment, we engage external uh, First Nations mentors and coaches to work with some of our First Nations employees. Um, we report on this directly every month to our Australian leadership team so they know where our people are sitting. Obviously, I think every business is very entry level heavy. And so when we have our uh, graduates coming to an end, they move into a professional role. So they they're moving up and we want to continue to watch that and invest into them, obviously. Um, we also uh, directly recruit into our senior leadership roles. So we have uh, engaged pipeline talent on a number of our roles. Um, I, I think it's important to not only partner with recruitment agency roles for the entry level and the pro professional and senior professional, but for those leadership roles, we've engaged them 
Um, and we're also looking at a sponsorship program for next year where we'll be engaging some of our um, high talent First Nations employees to partner and work with some of our executive leaders. Thank you. And I couldn't speak higher about the value of sponsorship. Having someone elevate an Indigenous leader and putting their name in the ring, you know, I think there's so much that we have control of right now to support mob moving up into those senior leadership positions. Um, and I particularly uh, the latest census data has really shown that, that Indigenous Australians are more skilled than ever. So it's really this opportunity that awaits. Um, I'd love to know from the panel if you could share one initiative um, within your attraction and recruitment approach that you're really proud of. I'm I'll take this in. one. Um, oh. You go, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think for me it's it's probably less of a single initiative that I'm proud of, but more so our talent acquisition team. And they're really the reason why we are bringing First Nations talent into our business. Um, you know, they, they ask questions and they're very genuine. They don't take no for an answer from the business. And I've had yarns go for hours with some of our talent acquisition team members because they want to understand and make sure that they're creating culturally safe recruitment process with their candidates um, from the outset. And I've been able to provide that safe space for them to ask those questions that can be uncomfortable with um, other people. It helps their learning. Um, and, you know, we talk about cultural load a little bit. There is that element to it. But the payoff is so much greater because we have an empowered talent acquisition team who knows how to work with community um, to ensure that they're, being, they're setting up their candidates for success to get these roles. Um, I think knowing that we have a genuine TA team who wants to do better and be better is the thing that I'm most proud of in this. Thank you. And Kelly? Um, I might change tact a little bit and just talk a bit to some of the things we've done that are impactful for the people either that we provide care to or the services that we provide. Um, and they're quite diverse in nature. Um, but it, uh, having these types of highly customized programs are one of the things that are really um, beneficial to us as an organization in attracting uh, First Nations people. Um, some examples would be um, in 2017, we um, ran an employment day for Fiona Stanley Hospital, and that was, uh, you know, really looking to partner in Western Australia around providing healthcare services on the ground, then working with local community providers. Um, for Acacia Prison, we actually developed a, um, an Indigenous guide, which was designed to um, really deeply um, understand the cultural nuances in, the, in that particular facility, um, help our staff to really develop cultural awareness, get some best practices um, to be scalable and uh, widely understood. And that's actually being rolled out around a number of our justice sites and has had enormous um, a good positive impact. Um, we do lots of volunteer things, so supporting not-for-profits organisations, um, delivering women's employment and business support workshops for First Nations women, um, and adopting Welcome to Country for formal gatherings, um, smoking ceremonies. Um, I've got one next week, actually, at um, a site, and we've got some government officials coming to that, and uh, many of our um, Aboriginal and Torres Islander people coming to that as well. Um, and we we also sponsor scholarships in the... In, um, uh, indigenous scholarships again that's important and um, there are all just, there are lots of other examples um, again around families so we um, had more than a thousand toys donated um, that were made in Clarence prison by um, prisoners in our care and uh, funds were raised then for at-risk youths to um, help prevent them returning back into the uh, justice system and all of these things just really are about community care, around people care, but they're impactful and really um, helping Circle to be an employer of choice for First Nations people who can really um, hook into some of these things we're doing to make an impact, um, just to make a real impact and difference in society. So not so much re recruitment specific, but they're important to recruitment and it's important that we showcase and talk about them. We embrace um programs like this and that we continue to invest in um, the relevant spaces when they're needed. Um, yeah, a bit of a different, different train of thought. 
No, I love that. Thank you. And Trish, any comments from you? Yeah, for sure, Caitlin. You know, like Amanda, I need to shout out our talent acquisition team. They're awesome. They just go that extra mile all the time. They're happy to travel. And like I said before, we get out into the community. We take that localised and personalised approach. And it's our talent acquisition team that are really the front facing of our organisation. And so, yeah, huge um, shout out to them and agree totally with Amanda. And, and with that kind of personalised and localised approach, we ensure that we understand the needs of those smaller communities, for example, where they may be regional, far remote areas, where the same kind of recruitment strategy just do not work. It's more like the Corey Grapevine that works better in those smaller communities than, um, you know, advertising in the mainstream type of way. So definitely proud that we have a team around us that understand that and also a management and leadership team who give us the scope to be able to do so. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this kind of leads nicely into the next question from one of our participants today. Um, it says, what are your views about a non-First Nations member leading the inclusion and diversity strategy for organisations? Would members of the community prefer someone from their own community? Um, and I just want to share another quick insight from our index that our research shown um, that when Indigenous recruitment is actually managed by an Indigenous or Indigenous employee, there are statistically significantly higher outcomes of the share of Indigenous employees compared to when it's managed by a non-Indigenous employee. Um, but I'm curious to open that up to the ladies on today. What are your views around um, Indigenous leadership? I'm happy to go first. Look, personally, of course, I 100% agree. And, Caitlin, the evidence is there, as you've stated. It's really important. It goes along with the line of what we've been saying this morning, that we elevate our people into leadership positions. And this position, crucially, as, um, you know, one of our uh, participants pointed out, is it's very important to have someone who identifies as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in. So very much agree and we'll always support that. Thank you. I um, might follow on there, Tricia, uh, on that as well and, and wholeheartedly agree. Um, having um, senior First Nations people in the organisation, it's crucial to success in, in helping our wider teams to better interpret our core services through the lens of the Indigenous community and uh, and people and ult ultimately make us a better service provider. Um, and to facilitate this, we, we do need to grow and maintain community relationships and have greater collaboration with uh, First Nations organisations uh, as well to continue to create momentum. Um, uh, so I think culturally, cultural safety for First Nations employees can uh, really um, benefit from having confidence in a two-way interaction with First Nations employees and the leadership team. Um, so, yeah, I, I think all perspectives are valuable, but we, we have invested in um, those key Indigenous um, positions, as I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, liaison officer, our programs manager, and um, multiple recruiters. Um, we've got people as well leading our traineeships and apprenticeship programs and um, some of our um, really niche cultural programs as well, uh, absolutely vital to success. Thank you. And Amanda? Yeah, so obviously I'm always supportive of First Nations people moving into leadership, and I think that's the goal for all of us. But I think we need to be realistic in that maybe the resources aren't there at the moment and you have to start somewhere, and that's been the case for GHG. Our reconciliation efforts were led by a non-First Nations woman and she engaged First Nations voices along the way. I think if you're a non-First Nations person who is leading these programs... I think it's fine as long as you're aware of your biases and your privileges um, and you are working to develop a First Nations person into that role. 
Thanks, Amanda. And, you know, we've had lots of conversations about this, you and I, and I think um, something we've talked a lot about is if you are non-Indigenous and working in those kinds of roles, having authentic relationships with communities is so critical to elevate those voices um, that will influence the kind of change to create a better system to support our mob in a range of employment um, and I really, I guess, want to just call out that Indigenous people don't just need to sit in rap roles. They don't need to just be sitting in Indigenous affairs roles, but to really open it up across your entire business. Um, I'm curious to hear from you today. I think um, we've talked a lot about what works and some of the positive experiences we've had, but I'd love to know, you know, what is a common mistake organisations make when trying to attract and recruit Indigenous talent? Um, we, I'm sure we've all made mistakes in this area. Our organisations have been on the journey for a long time. I can see Kelly nodding. Um, is there something you'd like to share, um, a common faux pas? Yeah, I think um, even though organisations may implement new recruitment and retention strategies and, you know, all the policies in the world, um, they might be successfully implemented, but work is ongoing and incremental improvements need to be made as we continue to gain mutual understanding and experience with um, First Nations communities. Um, the COVID pandemic impacted Circle's momentum by limiting access to local sites and um, some of those communities um, and that was a little bit of a setback so we're, um, we're definitely um, really taking that bespoke approach again in, um, in quite, a, quite a strong manner uh, to recoup that ground um, and ongoing investment in, uh, in key roles is a must, you, you need the backing. Um, you, you touched upon it as well, making sure that every role is open uh, to all and it's not certain roles for certain people. Um, um, I would say um, the other one has been around um, the improvement and ongoing improvement of pre-employment assessments, making sure that um, they are provided free as needed and customised training is provided as well. Um, one size fits all training generally has not worked for us. So we've taken a customised approach where we might um, uh, provide training for a role and there might be an assessment for the role. Um, but we, we've actually flipped that on its head and actually gone into uh, more sort of social environments and yarn circles, um, helped applicants to get their fitness levels up or to um, reach the required standards of skills and um, worked over a number of weeks pre-application to get people to that level. Um, so I just think you can't just go with a one size fits all and you can't think your work is completely done or ever done. It's not ever done. Um, I know I keep learning every day and, um, you know, just talking to people for half an hour in a role on, you know, on the front line or in a key role. Um, you, you can learn more than you can from any policy. So, yeah, I think just being humble and uh, not expecting the job to, to be done. It's not done. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Trish or Amanda? Amanda. Uh, I think one of the common mistakes businesses make um, is that they're rushing into their journey. I think anything First Nations at the moment is the hot ticket CSR, d &I, ESG thing to have. Um, and businesses are jumping right in because they're enthusiastic and they're passionate in the moment, but the First Nations space isn't a momentary thing. It's been worked on for a very long time and we're going to continue working on this for a very long time. And I think that plays into the well-intentioned versus well-informed argument. Attraction and recruitment also isn't the only thing businesses should be focusing on when it comes to First Nations employment. I, I think the focus should be on ensuring you have a culturally safe workplace, that you're educating your people and winning hearts and minds. Um, and that should absolutely be the priority here because if your workplace isn't safe, mob aren't going to stay and that defeats the purpose of why you entered into this journey, right? Um, and we don't want that. You know, the people who were really excited to start this and kick it off, they're going to end up feeling defeated as well. And we don't want that. We want them to feel empowered in this journey just as much as First Nations people whilst we're centering and elevating the First Nations voice um, and lived experiences, but working together to do things properly and establishing strong foundations is how you succeed. And I think that's why GHD has succeeded in these areas because we've always worked on ensuring our foundations are strong. 
and we didn't jump ahead um, ahead of ourselves into an innovate wrap. We started with a reflect wrap. We absolutely could have gone to an innovate. Um, we educated the business and we we got our leaders on board. Um, and I, I, I just generally think there's a real beauty in being humble with your starting place and remembering there is no end game because we are going to be working on this for a very long time. Yeah, I love that, Amanda. I mean, what you've really touched on is the Western approach of rushing in to have action instead of just stopping, reflecting on your approach, ask your staff what they want, and then build your foundations from there. I know I've had similar conversations with Trish. I mean, Trish, what do you have to add? Yeah, look, you know, Caitlin, I totally agree with everything that's been said. But for me, I always come back to this fundamental position of having our voice around the decision-making table. Now, whether that's at the policy and strategic decision-making table, the design table and the execution table, it is vitally important that we are included along all of the way from the start. And I guess, you know, if non-Indigenous Australians are working in this field and operating in a silo, you're likely to not succeed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Well, we've got a question here from one of the participants. It says, how do you avoid tokenism and move mob into positions of influence? Often mob end up in role in cultural type roles rather than actual senior decision making that can change organizational culture. So how do you avoid that tokenism? I think, um, you know, like I was speaking to before, be very defined in the areas that you're recruiting for. Um, make sure there's positions there and then go out specifically looking for that talent because we are there. It just may take a little bit longer to find us, but we are definitely there. So take that time and identify the roles that you would like your organisation to spread their, wing, their wings in. Yeah, thank you, Trish. And Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's um, taking the care to understand the capability of, uh, of individuals, really taking the care um, to, to deeply do that, you can't do that necessarily, um, you know, you know, without um, good, uh, yeah, just good interaction. So for, for us, I think it's about understanding every individual, their unique capabilities, their skills, um, and then having a good um, development program in place to get people up, um, you know, um, into that new role, whatever that may look like. And it does sometimes take time. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got, um, we've got really great mentorship in place. I think that's the key. So the one-to-one -one interaction is, um, and a trusted way can really sort of draw out those skills and capabilities so that we can get that fit. Um, where it's not there, upskilling is, is uh, essential. We've got a skills market, uh, we've got a skills shortage out there, we've got a candidate shortage market out there. So if we don't embrace the skills that are available to us and um, develop upon them, we're, you know, we're, we're um, going to constantly be facing that. So it's just about taking care and time to best understand each individual's capability, putting them Thanks. into the right role. Thanks, Kelly. And I can't preach enough about recognising the value of transferable skills. I think um, my background and many other mob I've met in my career have really demonstrated that you can have the most unusual work background, but how that relates to an organisational context, um, the value can be immense. And you also touched on... Um, the power of creating a culturally safe environment because that enables truth telling it enables indigenous employees to come to work as their full self and i think that's how you avoid tokenism by having a relationship in a safe place where your employees can tell you where they want to be um, so look we have our last question for today's session and thank you so much to our participants for the numerous questions I, I think we could be here all day so thank you so much for your engagement but I'm curious um, one of the main voted questions was what can be done to ensure that more workplaces are culturally safe acknowledging that this is a bit of a rabbit hole and a really important conversation so I would love to know from each speaker you know what do you see as something that can be done for a culturally safe workplace 
I mean, employing more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's a great start. You know, so MOB want to work with MOB. Um, and, you know, everyone's touched on how we try and create that safe space, training, um, making sure there's elements of support, like mentoring. The fundamentals are a commitment from the leadership to ensure that this all happens. So there's an ingredient there. Um, and if we follow that authentically, I think that the chances of success are, are quite high. Thank you. And Amanda? I echo everything Trish said, um, but absolutely around hiring more well, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and making sure they've got that community um, and connection with other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employees is so important. And I think every business should have a cultural learning strategy, you know, so that you're making that conscious effort. Um, you have those programs available for staff to tap into. So obviously your e-learning modules have those face-to-face, -face, well, probably not face-to-face -face in this, <laughs> the post-COVID world, um, but have those workshops, engage those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experts um, who work in this space. GHD has also uh, recently recruited a cultural learning advisor. And so he is an Aboriginal man and he's got 40 years experience in the educational space and so he's going to come into our business get to know you know our teams our people um you know start to formulate what he wants to do with the business to ensure that it's a culturally safe place so even creating a role like that and recruiting for a role like that there's so much talent out there I've seen the CVs um you know just make it happen um but absolutely continuously sent our First Nations voices thank you and Kelly yeah maybe just to add to that the make it happen piece um uh, for, for me, I like to start at um, education level and what we can do in industry to um, really help um, bridge some of the education to employment kind of pathways um, and starting at an early age in schools to, um, you know, help people to um, gain the required skills, whether it's about interview techniques, whether it's about what to expect in employment um, whether it is to build on confidence and uh, a lot of the softer skills um, and also helping um, inside of schools um, to lift the awareness of what types of jobs are available, all manner of jobs, and uh, making them more accessible and removing um, barriers or, um, you know, misconceptions about what kind of work people can do. Um, so we love doing that. Um, same with career fairs, getting out on the front line into the local communities, having, you know, feet on the ground and spending time um, really promoting um, some of the opportunities in industry and definitely making them more widely available from a very young age. That will help us to get people through into employment and um, into entry level roles um, as well. But um, yeah, not taking away from the progression then once inside the organization and the importance of, uh, of um, training and uh, mentorship and how valuable they are in the culturally safe environment. The, the training piece, for sure, we've got lots of different initiatives there. Um, often bringing in third party providers as well, where we don't have the experience, making sure we've got the right partners with the capability to provide uh, different types of training through different channels uh, to as many of our employees as possible. That's what helps. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. Look, this has been such a valuable discussion. Some of the themes I've heard today is that organisations really just need to stop and reflect on how they're ensuring a comprehensive and systematic approach towards Indigenous employment to ensure, you know, authentic and sustainable outcomes when it comes to bringing on our mob and attracting and recruiting them. I've also heard a lot about the cultural safety needed in organisations, but also the authentic relationships with your people to ensure that we, we see the positive change that we want and to consider the Indigenous employee value proposition. Why do Indigenous employees want to work with your organisation and how can we tailor your approach to meet the needs and aspirations of Indigenous employees? So, look, I just want to, again, just give a huge shout out and my 
thanks and appreciation to Amanda, Trish and Kelly for your contribution today and to CEDA for creating a platform to share important topics like this. So thank you so much. Um, I, so we will be rounding out by sharing a link with everyone today with a recording of the session. Um, it will also be on CEDA's website in approximately one week. But please stay in touch for upcoming conversations via cedar.com.au where you can also register for CEDA's upcoming events, which is the Labor Market Update, Mind the Skills Gap, and also the 30 years since Paul Keating's Redfern Address in Sydney. So look, thank you so much, everyone, again, for your time today. Really enjoyed it. Have a great start to your week.